For hundreds of years, black gunpowder was the only kind of gun propellant, and its composition changed very little over the centuries. While it certainly worked, it burned very inefficiently, created huge clouds of smoke that fouled everything around it, and obscured the battle space. It was also unstable and could ignite without very much provocation. From a design standpoint, it had another big problem. It burned so fast it could almost be called an explosion, which is a very bad thing in gun barrels. This graph shows a pressure curve inside a barrel as a projectile moves through it. The red line indicates the barrel's strength. Any pressure that exceeds it will likely deform the barrel and make it useless. The yellow line is roughly equivalent to the pressure of black powder and shows how most of it burns at the beginning, causing a pressure spike that may exceed barrel strength. Pressure then drops rapidly before the shell moves very far through the bore. The result is not only an overstressed and damaged barrel, but also a projectile that will not accelerate to the desired velocity. This cross-section shows how large cannon of the late 19th century were designed with an immensely thick breech to withstand the high initial pressure. Its short barrel also allows the shell to leave the gun before pressure drop can slow it. These were the central problems with guns of all sizes until the development of smokeless powder. Improvements were made to black powder in the latter half of the 19th century that resulted in what was called brown or cocoa powder, but they didn't fully solve the fast burn problem. Smokeless powder was the ultimate solution. The name is an exaggeration because it smoked a lot when it burned, but it was far cleaner than black powder. It was very difficult to manufacture, requiring an incredibly complex process that was extremely hazardous at many stages of production. In spite of that, it was worth the effort. It was more stable, burned cleaner and more efficiently, and more importantly, it burned much slower than black powder. This allowed lighter gun weight and longer barrels that greatly increased the ability to accelerate shells for higher velocities. Let's compare the 12-inch 35 caliber brown powder guns built in 1897 with the 12-inch 45 caliber smokeless design used in 1910. Both were the same bore size and fired the same weight shell, but the newer smokeless powder gun was 10 feet longer to take advantage of its slower burning rate. While both elevated to 15 degrees and fired an 870 pound shell, the older gun had a range of 12,000 yards, while the smokeless powder gun could fire the same weight shell 20,000 yards. That's an amazing 67% improvement, and there would have been an even greater improvement in range if black powder had been used. U.S. smokeless powder was a single base propellant because it contained only nitrocellulose as its major ingredient. It was formed into perforated cylinders and packed into bags. Other countries, including Great Britain and Japan, relied upon a double base propellant, commonly called cordite, that contained nitroglycerin as a second major ingredient. This was produced in long strands that were bundled and placed in bags. Because it contained less energy, more SP was required to fire a shot, but it was more stable and safer to handle. In fact, a 1920s ordnance manual stated that a grain of SP lit with a match could be extinguished simply by blowing on it. However, moisture and warm temperatures could quickly deteriorate it so that it not only lost performance, but could become unstable and very dangerous. These problems were largely corrected when diphenylamine was added as a stabilizer to create a powder called SPD. SPDN was yet another improvement that added compounds to reduce its ability to absorb water. These two propellants were the types used on Texas throughout World War II. The basic ingredient for all U.S. smokeless powder, from the lowly 22 pistol and rifle cartridge to the monstrous 16-inch guns on Iowa-class battleships is the same, nitrocellulose. However, the needs of the two sizes were very different, as was the design of the powder itself. The 22 uses tiny, flat flakes, while the 16-inch guns required large, thumb-sized grains. While many shapes were used by different countries for their large guns, the U.S. settled on the perforated cylinder. Why is that? One reason to use a cylinder is that it's made by extruding while in a paste form through dies that give precise control of the grain's shape and size. This is critical to assure precise and repeatable burning characteristics. However, there's a problem with it in other solid shapes. Let's go back to the pressure curve. As the shell moves through the bore, the amount of space behind it rapidly increases. In order to accelerate the shell during its trip through the barrel, the amount of ignition gases created by burning powder must increase at a very fast rate to maintain high pressure inside that constantly enlarging space. SP grains only burn on their surface, so as they burn, they get smaller, meaning that the surface area gets smaller and the rate of gas production decreases. This results in pressure dropping too soon and the shell does not accelerate well. 
to solve that problem, let's put a hole in the cylinder. Notice that as the surface of the hole burns, it gets larger, so it progressively produces more gas. Unfortunately, the larger outer surface gets smaller at the same time, and the hole cannot offset it. While the result is an improvement over a solid cylinder, it isn't enough. The Navy's solution was to have seven perforations. Having seven holes gave seven times more inner surface area that overcame the progressive reduction of outer surface area. With that, ignition gas production increased as the grains burned through to continue pressurizing the space behind the shell as it accelerated through the bore. All of this worked well until the solid areas between holes burned through. At that point, they became several small solids that rapidly diminished in size. With burn through, gas production dropped practically to zero, and the design goal for the powder and gun barrel was for the shell to be clearing the muzzle right at that point. It should be pretty obvious that both the size of the grains and the quantity used in a charge are keys in producing the amount and rate of gas needed to accelerate a shell. But there's another critical factor, the space between the perforations called the web. Burning grains were only able to effectively do their work as long as the holes didn't burn through to one another, so the thickness of the web was a critical design feature. Here's a set of dimensions for grains used in 14 and 16 inch guns. Notice that the grain diameters increase as the guns get larger, and equally important, web thicknesses also increase. This means that as bore diameters and lengths got larger, thicker webs were required to keep grains producing gas at the amount and rate needed in the particular gun they were designed for. Having said that, it was also important that webs not be too thick. If they were, much of the powder would burn after the shell left the barrel and would be wasted, so the design required a careful balance that tuned powder to the gun that it was to be fired in. A full charge for a 14-inch gun weighed 420 pounds, and it was 655 pounds for an Iowa-class 16-inch gun. That much powder was far too large and weighed too much to be put into brass cartridges like was used on smaller cannon, and you certainly couldn't shovel it loose into the breech behind the shell. The answer was to put it in silk bags, each weighing a little over 100 pounds. This made it possible for crew to reasonably handle the four bags needed for 14-inch guns and six for 16-inch guns. But why silk? It's because when this gun fires, you don't want any residue left behind that could ignite bags rammed into it for the next shot. Silk burns to a fine ash that leaves no significant particles behind. Considering that there were millions of powder bags produced during World War II, it's easy to understand why silk stockings were so hard to find. There were two types of bags, which were also called sections when described in ordnance and gunnery manuals. One held a dump charge in which the correct weight of grains was measured, then simply dumped into a bag. The bag was then cinched up using laces on its side and top to make it as tight as possible, but it was still fairly loose. This caused a problem since the grains were very hard and had sharp edges on their ends. Since they could move around, the grains would rub against one another during handling and from vibration and pounding through the ship's structure while at sea. This could damage the powder and change its burning characteristics, or worse, it could cut through the bags. A solution for the problem was adopted for bags used in most 8-inch and larger guns in 1915. It was called a stacked charge. A complicated machine was used to neatly stack powder grains in uniform layers inside the bag. This not only eliminated the majority of damage to grains and bags, it also created a tight bag that was smaller and easier to handle. The fact that all grains were organized the same way from one bag to the next further enhanced uniform burning. We mentioned earlier that SP powder was difficult to light. That was also true of SPD and SPDN. Because of that, it was practically impossible for the small primer used to fire the gun to directly ignite the charge. That's where the red patch on the back of every bag comes into play. It's called the ignition patch, and it contained 300 grams, or about 10.5 ounces, of fine black gunpowder. Without that, the primer stood very little chance of igniting the charge. However, the powder was easily ignited and acted as a booster that reliably ignited the smokeless powder. Notice that the patch is cross-stitched. This divides the patch into a number of small pockets so that black powder won't settle to the bottom of the patch where it can't be ignited by the primer flame. This patch received the most concern from gun crews. If damaged, it could spill black powder on the deck where just about anything could ignite it. For that reason, any bag that had a tear in it was immediately dumped in one of the immersion tanks located throughout the turret structure to make it safe. Loose powder was then swept up and dumped in the tank or hosed down if sweeping wasn't practical. 
As a side note, immersed bags were kept wet and ultimately sent back to the factory where the powder could be reprocessed to new condition. Bags and powder continued to evolve during and after World War II. Compounds were added to create so-called flashless powder that somewhat reduced muzzle flash, but at the cost of more smoke. Other compounds were added in the form of packets inserted with bags that reduced bore wear and extended gun life. In 